So you've probably traveled abroad, and if you haven't traveled abroad, you've met people from different countries in whatever context you're living in. And if you haven't done that, and I hope you have, you've at least watched World Cup soccer on television. <laughs> One of the things that you might have noticed is there's incredible similarity, but also diversity in people's expression of emotion across culture. As an affective scientist, one of my questions in, of my research has been, what is it that explains the differences across culture in the expression and the experience of emotion? And today, I'm going to tell you a little story about how I came up with an answer or a potential answer to this question. I was living in France, and I have four boys, and none of them wanted me to read them the Laura Ingalls Wilder books the books like The Little House on the Prairie and On the Banks of Plum Creek. So I read them by myself all over again as an adult in France. One of the things that I noticed, or that struck me, among many other things, of course, is that unlike the country that I was living in, the populations described in these books were highly diverse in their ancestral background. There were Swedes living next to Poles, living next to Germans, living next to Norwegians, and of course, that's only a small set of diversity in our country, in the United States. And somehow, they had to work together to thrash the grain and bring it to a, an elevator and sell that grain and, and survive, basically. What's interesting about that, noticing that, is that it suggested to me that the historical heterogeneity of a particular country's population, which we can also be called ancestral diversity, might be, in part, the explanation for variation across cultures in the experience and the expression of emotion. You're like, what? Well, think about what happens when you live in a country in which there are constant waves of immigration and input of people from different countries that bring with them different languages for emotion and different expectations for the emotions that you're supposed to have in a particular situation. Are you supposed to express anger? Are you supposed to be happy? Actually, that can vary across culture. And when we move to a different country, we bring those with us. The challenge, then, is to have all of that diversity in emotion language and in our expectations for emotional experience, and yet create new groups who have to work together and pursue common goals successfully. That's actually really, really hard. The countries of the world differ enormously in whether or not its present-day population had to address those tasks over hundreds of years. Very my idea was this. Maybe 500 years of the creation of countries' populations through patterns of immigration, bringing people with different emotion language and different norms to a population, would result in differences in the use of nonverbal behavior and the explicitness of nonverbal behavior, and even in the use of particular facial expressions that are designed precisely to create trust and collaboration when you don't know each other. So you could say, how in the world did you ever study that? Well, I studied it by finding a metric for the extent to which a country's present-day population is created from many source countries, many different countries of the world, or just a few. It took me a long time to find that metric. I made phone calls to historians and demographers and political scientists, and finally I found that several behavioral economists had also wanted to know the extent to which today's population of every country derives from all the other um, countries of the world. And I said, oh, thank goodness, because I couldn't possibly have created that metric. Here's, an, here's a demonstration of the historical heterogeneity of the countries of the world. The countries that are represented in a dark blue or dark, dark purple are those that have received their population from many, many, many source countries. And the countries depicted in much lighter all the way to light have received, in today's population, fewer um, source countries. Now remember, countries are different sizes. So there can be geographic locations within countries that are stable, too. 
And we'll talk more about that in a second. Well, what could I do with this metric? One of the things that I could do was to test a hypothesis that I had, which I just referred to earlier, about the explicitness of our emotional communications. I could take the metric of historical heterogeneity and ask the question, do people in countries with high ancestral diversity agree, that is adopt the norm, of explicit emotional expression? That's called a display rule. Maybe those countries where the Swedes had to meet with the Germans and had, to t and had to interact with the Poles and had to interact with people from many other Asian countries and South American countries and ultimately African countries as well, maybe those people have all agreed that when you feel an emotion, you should express it bodily. Why? Because that way we could at least communicate even in light of the constraints that we have in communicating in language. So one of the studies that we did involved reanalyzing display rule data from a study that had already been conducted, looking at at least 30 or 31 countries of the world. In these, these people from these countries reported their display rules for emotions. A display rule favors emotional expressivity, or it could favor dissimulation. That would mean, oh yeah, w in our country, when you have a strong emotion, we usually learn to not express it too strongly or not strongly at all. Of course, our hypothesis was the stronger the display rule for emotional expressivity, the higher the ancestral diversity of the country, and that's what we found. In fact, compared to a lot of other predictors, such as the current diversity of the country, historical heterogeneity explained the largest variance of this behavior. We also could ask another question, which is, what's another pressure on people from uh, countries with high historical heterogeneity? And another pressure is to make a facial expression that everybody else across all these different cultures that we're living with now can actually recognize. That would be a question, is historical heterogeneity related to sort of transparency or universality of expression? We could also test that question. We could take many, many studies in which facial expressions by one culture were shown to people from another culture. And we could say, how high is the accuracy in recognizing emotions across culture as a function of the country of the person making the expression? Our hypothesis was, if you come from a country with high ancestral diversity, people all over the world are going to be more accurate at reading your facial expressions, and that's what we found. So if you come from a country like Brazil, on average, your facial expressions are easier for people around the world to recognize. It's not a good or a bad thing, it's something that has to be done if you're going to successfully communicate your emotions with people who don't have the same expectations for emotions as you do. You need to tell the Polish guy or the Polish woman that that's all the wheat you want, or that that's all the wheat that you have, or that you do want them to pick it up, or that you need somebody to help you um, combine wheat on the weekend. And one way to do it is to express strongly what your emotional needs are, through facial expression, for example. Another question that you can ask and that I posed earlier was a relationship between the historical heterogeneity of a country and its use of smiles. Why smiles? Because smiles are very complex and different smiles can successfully solve different social tasks, some of which are particularly important in countries with high ancestral diversity versus those that are low in ancestral diversity. In one very, very large study, psychologists who are at the University of Pittsburgh were able to access um, videos of individuals all over the world, and not just a couple of them, but over 800,000, looking at advertisements online, so they're videos of their faces while they're watching, and those advertisements varied in how amusing they were and how interesting they were. Then the psychologist predicted the amount of smiling during watching of the, um, of the um, advertisements. And what they found was that individuals from countries of high ancestral diversity actually smiled significantly more than those from countries with low ancestral diversity. They just did a lot of smiling. Remember that I told you that smiling is a pretty important expression. It is used to create 
trust between two people who do not know each other, and particularly if they don't share norms and they don't share language that's nuanced. And you might know if you've traveled abroad that language about emotion is the hardest one to learn, particularly in terms of register, how strong is the emotion, not which emotion is it. Well, interestingly, we could ask the question of sort of general reports of smiling and laughter because the Gallup poll conducted a global emotions poll in which there was a question which was, how much did you smile and laugh yesterday? So we could replicate the previous study that I just showed you and look at the amount of smiling across the globe as a function of the extent to which the population was derived from many, many source countries, that is, had high ancestral diversity or low ancestral diversity. And what we found was a clear relationship between the ancestral diversity of a country and the amount of smiling that people do there on average. The higher ancestral diversity of that country, the more smiling that you see and the more that they reported. That makes sense, right? Again, you can imagine that after hundreds of years of people immigrating from countries that had different languages and different norms for emotion, then a country would adopt a general culture of using smiles to develop trust and to signal safety in social interaction. Indeed, there's not just one kind of smile. Remember I told you that there are at least three kinds of smiles and they're derived, we believe, to solve very specific tasks in social interaction. One kind of smile tells you to do that behavior again. You do a behavior and a person makes a smile and you feel good. It reaches right down to the reward centers of your brain and you do do it again. We call that a reward smile because the function is to reward the behavior of somebody else. Works really well with preverbal infants whom you cannot tell that that was a good thing to do, but they can feel that it was a good thing to do if you smile at them. But we also have to signal that we're not threatening and that really doesn't have anything to do with feeling good. What we, when, when an elevator door opens and you walk into a very small area with somebody else, they often make the facial expression in the middle of this slide. That is, they say, I'm not threatening. You can let the elevator door close and be in this tiny space with me and nothing is going to happen. That's a very important kind of smile. And actually, not only is it authentic, but it might be the most frequent that you see during the day. Finally, we can also negotiate social hierarchies with our smile without causing actual aggression. Even if you're not dominant or superior to somebody, you sure can signal very quickly that you're critical of the behavior or you're better at it than they are if you make the smile on the far right. A smile of dominance can tell somebody very quickly that you feel superior to them in that particular behavior or domain. Well, these smiles are not e equally important across the world. If we think about historically heterogeneous cultures, we could imagine that these first two smiles are particularly important. Whereas in cultures in which there is less historical heterogeneity, hierarchies have been formed for a long time. And it might be very important to not destroy those hierarchies, but be able to use smiles that negotiate it without aggression. Indeed, in another um, cross-cultural study, we found that individuals from historically heterogeneous cultures, those that are represented by the yellow bars, did report that reward and affiliation smiles were significantly more important or frequent um, than did individuals in historically homogeneous cultures. But for the dominant smile, this was reversed. This sort of safe way of negotiating pre-existing or long-standing um, hierarchies were pretty important. So, you know, countries vary also in their um, historical heterogeneity or the ancestral diversity of its populations, and the United States are no different. This is the ancestral diversity of the states of the United States. The darker colors represent greater historical heterogeneity, and you will see that there's a strong link between the water passageways and long history migration patterns. So you live in a quite historically heterogeneous area. Well, one of the questions we could ask was, are, are smiling and laughter more frequent in historically heterogeneous parts of the United States? And the answer is yes. So you live not only in a state in which there's high ancestral diversity, 
you also live in a pretty smiley state. And rather than being worried about concepts like Minnesota nice, you might just think about the fact that people who live in historically diverse areas have had to use things like smiles and positive interactions in order to get along and to create um, um, collaborative interactions. So I just argued that the countries of the world and even the states of the United States vary in the makeup of their populations and that the tasks that people have to perform there are very different. 500 years or even 300 years of interacting with people who don't share our norms could lead to very different cultures of emotion. And we have pretty good examples of how that's true now. Thank you. <laughs>